five in the morning is that the Conservatives are now past the finishing post. They have won a majority in this campaign, and that is the formal result for us. As you can see, we've won before, and now we need to deliver a strategy to win again. Nine years ago, before I was, was a minister, minister and, and long, long before, before I became chairman, I was a 40-40 target seat MP. And in target seats like mine, the 2015, 2015 general election wasn't about Labour's failures. It wasn't about Jeremy Corbyn or getting Brexit done. done. It was about our local record of delivery. In just two years' time, our record of delivery will once again be a deciding factor in how people vote. So we need a massive effort to get our local success stories out, to share the incredible things we've achieved together as a party, and to let people know about the important work that we're still doing, creating jobs, investing in public services, and improving lives. And that's what the 8020 Target Seat campaign is all about. This is a targeted, focused campaign based, based on, on the 80 marginal seats we need to hold and the 20 marginal seats we have a serious chance of gaining. We're, We're going to need a huge effort from everyone here today, every single activist, every single member and every single association, just like we had in 2015. Because whilst the last two elections were short and snappy, this campaign will take place over two years, just like the 2015 campaign. No one is saying it's going to be easy, but if we pull together, I know from personal experience what a difference it can make. And I'm thrilled to say that we've already hit the ground running. We've got new campaign managers across the country helping MPs tell their stories. The first leaflet of the 8020 campaign is hitting doorsteps this summer. And over the next two years, there'll be an opportunity for everyone here and at home to play a role whether that's sharing content on social media or talking to voters and changing minds. I'm confident that if we come together, put that effort in and get our message out, we can win the next general election. In the meantime, I hope you enjoy the hustings. We've got two excellent candidates and they're both clearly ready to be Prime Minister. But no matter which candidate you choose, let's remember that the country will be making a choice two years from now, a Labour government or a Conservative government. So let's get to work. Good evening, Team Southwest. 
This is the second hustings in our national tour, and for me, it's good to be here on my home territory in our great southwest. Thank you all for attending this evening, and it's good to see so many friends and colleagues in the audience. These hustings are for us, the members of the party, to take part in a great exercise of democracy where we get to choose our new leader. He or she will be announced on the 5th of September, and as we're the party of government, then will become Prime Minister very soon after. As Ian Dale, who moderated many of these hustings in 2019, said, and I quote, I found chairing the hustings a surprisingly positive experience. The members really put the two candidates through their paces and asked some very searching questions. So I ask tonight that you make your questions searching, make them succinct, and ask questions and not make statements. And one question each, please, so that more of the audience here have a chance to ask questions. Both of our candidates have a duty and a desire to fulfill our 2019 manifesto. Their, their differences will be about how to go about achieving that in a very different world from 2019, which is post-Brexit, post-COVID, in uncertain times internationally, and where our union as a nation is being challenged. So I'm sure that you want to test our candidates and to seek to establish their strengths and to see who you think is best capable of running our great country. As we're all Conservatives, I know that you'll be respectful of our two candidates and keep your questions positive. For them, for me and our CCHQ team, who have worked so diligently to set up these hustings at short notice, and in midsummer, these hustings run on a tight schedule until the 31st of August, when we have our last final rally in London. As you know, our ballot opens soon. You can cast your vote online or by post. We ask that where possible, you cast your vote online. Quite simply, it costs us less, and I'm sure that we want our hard-earned funds to go into campaigning. So my hope is that this evening will give you much more clarity about how to cast your vote. I hope that you'll all go away enthused and energised in your commitment to helping our party win the next election. We need your help and support. Finally, I'd like to thank our Southwest Regional Chairman, Julian Ellicott, for all the work that he does on our behalf. Julian, you do a great job. I hope very much. I hope very much that you enjoy your evening. Times is Whitehall editor and best-selling author Seb Payne. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, and as you just heard, my name is Sebastian Payne. I'm Whitehall editor of the Financial Times, and I've written a book, which I'm going to try and mention as many times as possible this evening. Um, for those of you who buy the Financial Times, well, thank you. You're paying my salary, and you'll be very well aware I've written a lot about the Conservative Party, but also this contest. And for those of you who don't read the Financial Times, well, I'm sorry for you, and I would strongly advise you do. There's some great subscription offers online to get lots of news. This is the second husting of the 2022 Conservative leadership election. I hope to stand on the shoulders of Nick Ferrari and all my other fellow journalists who have um, hosted such events. Now, we've got a lot to get through, and in the spirit of southwestern hospitality, I'm certain it's going to be a very warm, well, it certainly is warm, and friendly evening. This is how things will run. For our pair of contenders, we'll hear from their supporters, see some no doubt rather snazzy introduction videos before their speeches, and then I'll be asking them some questions. But the core of this evening is you, the party members with the weight of choosing the next UK Prime Minister on your shoulders. I want to get through as many of your questions as possible, so do keep them short, uh, to the point, and if possible, please put a question mark at the end of them. 
they will be roving helpers with microphones to go around the hall to get them when we get to that point. But that's enough for me, you're not here to listen to a journalist bang on, so please welcome to the stage our first speaker for this evening, the Right Honourable Penny Borden, MP. Ladies and gentlemen, the feeling is entirely mutual. Thank you so much for being here tonight. The fact that so many of you are is testament to how every single one of you cares deeply about the task that's been afforded to us. This isn't just about one person. It's about all of us. And I know it's not easy you feel a huge responsibility. I do too. That is the price, I'm afraid, of democracy. If we get this decision wrong, we'll shortchange the country. We may lose an election. And everything that we have worked for will be gone. That's why this matters so much. Why you feel that responsibility and why I do too, and why I'm here with you this evening. I could have remained undeclared. I could be off sipping pina coladas right now, but I'm not. I'm here with you. Because this, this is too important. And I'm, I'm not going to leave this to chance. And nor will you. I came third in this contest, and I owe it to all of you to be a signpost, not a weather vane. And so I've made my choice. And I know it's difficult, because I like both candidates. They are both good conservatives who love their country, and they both done what they thought was right, for the right reasons. I want to say nice things about both of them, which is probably why I came third. <laughs> I know that choosing between them is hard. But this contest is a test. A test that precedes an even greater test. So who can lead? Who can build that team and deliver for our country? Who does have that bold economic plan that our nation needs? Who's got reach? Who can relate to people? Who understands that people need help with the cost of living now? And who is going to rightly clobber our opponents? Who is going to hold seats and win back councils? And who most embodies the vision and values the British public had in their heads and their hearts when they voted in 2016 and 2019? At the start of this final phase of the contest, I didn't know the answer to those questions, but I've seen enough to know who the person I'm going to put my faith in is and that is Liz Truss. Yeah. Her graft, her authenticity, her determination, her ambition for this country, her consistency and sense of duty, she knows what she believes in, and her resolve to stand up against tyranny and fight for freedom. That's what our country stands for, and that's why I know with her 
we can win. And actually, seeing her over the last few weeks has made me want to help her, to help her win, to help build the team we need to win the country, and to give ourselves as a party and as a nation the pride and the confidence we need to reach our full potential. In short, folks, to give us all hope. She, for me, is the hope candidate. And that is why I am here tonight, to be straight with all of you and to tell you that my choice in this contest to lead us and our nation is Liz Truss. Thank you. And I know that a united Conservative Party can unleash the potential of all the people who make our country so great. To win the next election, we need to deliver, deliver and deliver for the British people. I know that our country's best days lie ahead. I'm the candidate with a clear vision for the future who can drive change and get things done. As a trade secretary, I'm negotiating deals with allies like Australia and Japan, creating opportunities around the world for British business. And as Prime Minister, I will continue to deliver on the opportunities of Brexit. I will lead a government committed to core conservative principles, low taxes, a firm grip on spending, driving growth in the economy, and giving people the opportunity to achieve anything they want to achieve, regardless of their background. I will work day and night to lead a party in the government that puts more money in your pocket and secures a better life for you and your family. I've consistently delivered when I have said I would. And I love our country. I want the best for us all. And I'm the person to deliver that. Please welcome Liz Truss. to be here in Exeter and it's fantastic to have the support of Penny Mordaunt. She's a great person, she's a great politician, she's a great patriot and I'm proud to call her my friend. Now I remember back in 2015, swathes of the South West were under the control of a dark force, the Liberal Democrats and I remember going out there on the streets to the farm shops, to the farms, to the Cornish pasty factories. I turned out not to be very good at crimping Cornish pasties, but with you know, great candidates like Kevin Foster, like Scott Mann, like Jane Teefee. And I remember how hard we worked. There were long hours and long days. I remember a particular afternoon at Sheppey's Cider. Very, very difficult work, but somebody had to do it. But what we did, what we did, is we rooted those Liberal Democrats out of the South West. Their fake bar charts, their Euro luck, their high taxes. And we made sure we won for the Conservatives. And what I want to tell you, as your Prime Minister, first of all, I would win back Tiverton and Honiton. And secondly, secondly, I would never, ever, ever I would never, ever, ever allow them to encroach in the Southwest again. Because, ladies and gentlemen, I'm a fighter. I didn't come from a traditional conservative background. I grew up in Paisley and in Leeds, where I went to a comprehensive school. And I remember children at my school being let down. They were let down by low expectations. They were let down by a lack of opportunity. And they were let down by the left-wing Leeds City Council 
who cared more about political correctness than making sure everybody could read and write. And that made me want to do something about the appalling waste of talent in this country. I wanted things to be better. And I believe that everybody should be able to succeed, regardless of where they're from, regardless of their background. I want us to be an aspiration nation. And that's why I'm standing to be your Prime Minister. But we need to be honest. We do face difficult times. We have the economic crisis after COVID. We have the appalling war perpetrated by Vladimir Putin in Ukraine. Now is not the time for business as usual. Now we have to be bold. We need a plan for growth. And that is what I will do. First of all, I'll unleash all of the opportunities of Brexit, from investment to procurement. I will get all of those EU laws off our statute books by the end of 2023, and I will replace them, making us more dynamic, more competitive, and more ready to attract investment. I'll reverse the increase in national insurance. We should have kept our manifesto commitment, and we didn't need to do it. And I think it is wrong when families are struggling to pay their bills to put up their taxes. I'd also, I'd also have a temporary moratorium on the green levy, so people see an immediate reduction, an immediate reduction, an immediate reduction in their fuel bills. Because I know that people are struggling with the cost of living. And I want to be on the side of people who go out to work, who do the right thing, who are self-employed, who set up small businesses. Those are the people we as Conservatives should be on the side of. And I will also keep corporation tax low. I think it's wrong that we are planning to raise corporation tax to the same level as France. Last time I looked, France was not a low tax country. And we need, we need to keep our economy competitive. We need to attract investment right across this country, but we need to particularly attract it into places like the southwest of England. Now, I believe in levelling up, but levelling up for me is not just about the north, it's also about our rural communities, it's about helping people who don't have the best infrastructure, where it's hard to get a mobile phone signal, where the broadband doesn't work, those are the people I want to help. And what I would do is rip up, I would rip up, I would rip up the Treasury investment rules and make sure it's fair. Because you all know that the services are better in London and the South East than they are here. And we need to change that. I also want to have low tax investment zones where we can unleash opportunity and we can build more homes for local people going to local jobs to give people opportunities here in the South West. Now, before I became an MP, I was a councillor. And as part of my job as a councillor, I sat on the planning committee. And I can tell you, those are hours of my life that I will never get back. <laughs> because we all know that you sit there making those decisions and you get overruled by somebody in Bristol, or you get a top-down housing target from Whitehall. I will abolish those top-down targets, and I will give local people control of what happens in their area. I will also... I will also back our farmers. I want our farmers producing food. We know how difficult the global situation is. We need food security. Farmers should be getting on with farming, not having to fill in forms, not having to comply with all kinds of rules and regulations. And our fields should be full of our fantastic produce. You know, whether it's the great livestock, the great arable farms, it shouldn't be full of solar panels. And I will change the rules, I will change the rules to make sure to make sure we're using our high-value agricultural land for farming. And what I will also do is I will back our fishermen. Now in 2026, there is going to be a new negotiation. And I will make sure, as an independent coastal state, 
we have full control over our fishing waters. And you know, you know that I am the person who will be tough on the EU. I took on the Northern Ireland Protocol negotiations. We didn't get what we needed for the EU. I developed the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. We secured a majority in Parliament. We will get it through. We will sort out that issue, and we will be on the side of our fishermen. I will also, I will also continue to stand up for Vladimir, to Vladimir Putin. Now, I put in place the toughest sanction regime on Russia. I also worked with my colleagues to make sure we were the first European country supplying weapons to Ukraine. But we can't rest on our laurels. We need to make sure, we need to make sure that our defence spending is in line with the threat which has increased. So I will raise defence spending to 3% of GDP by the end of the decade. I'll back our armed services and I'll make sure, I'll make sure I'll make sure that our veterans are protected. I will also tackle the issue of small boats in the English Channel. I worked with Priti Patel on the Rwanda deal. I want to do more deals like that. And I will legislate in Britain to make sure the ECHR cannot overrule our policy to tackle illegal immigration. That is vitally important. But as well as freedom and democracy abroad, we need it here at home. And I'm a straight-talking Yorkshire woman. I know a woman is a woman. <laughs> you, know, you, might, you, you, you might laugh, but that's become a controversial statement in some parts of Britain today. I will protect single-sex spaces, such as domestic violence shelter, and I will make sure that we stand up for the United Kingdom and we're proud of our history. Not just standing up for it overseas, but also rejecting the naysayers and declinists who say that our country's best days are behind us. They're not. Our best days are in front of it. And that is what I will deliver as your Prime Minister. I know that we can deliver. I know we can get things done. I will channel the spirit, and I was at Wembley last night watching the lionesses. I will channel the spirit of the lionesses who fought bravely against the odds and got things done and delivered a massive, massive victory. And that's what we can do. That's what we can do for the United Kingdom as we unlock our potential against the plastic patriot Keir Starmer. And that is what we can do from the Conservative Party. Because people who voted Conservative from the blue wall to the red wall to Cornwall. They voted Conservative because they wanted Conservative policies, not because they wanted higher taxes, not because they wanted Labour light. They voted for us because they believe in our values. And we have to have that confidence in ourselves. And that is what I will deliver as your Prime Minister. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, everyone. That was obviously Liz Truss and Penny Morden. Now on to the third speaker for this evening. Um, please welcome to the stage the Right Honourable Dr Liam Fox, MP. Please welcome Dr Liam Fox. Well, good evening, everyone. When he was still Prime Minister and I was Defence Secretary, I was on a plane with David Cameron going to Afghanistan, and we were discussing the Conservative Party. He said, Liam, I regard myself as a Liberal Conservative. How do you regard yourself? And I thought, this could be career-defining, this particular answer. So I said, well, David, I regard myself as an unreconstructed, free-market, Thatcherite, unionist, eurosceptic, Atlanticist. <laughs> there was something of a pause, as you can imagine, after that. But I know what sort of conservative I am, as you will know what sort of conservatives you are. 
And I know what sort of leader I want as leader of our party. I want someone who believes in sound money, who understands the value of small businesses, who believes in strong defence, who values the union of the United Kingdom, and not only believed in but campaigned for Brexit. But it's not just policy that this election is about, of course, but it's about character. Being Prime Minister means taking tough decisions, even when you're unpopular. Mrs Thatcher once said to me, my dear, she had a way of saying, my dear, if you want to be popular, go into light entertainment, she said. Politics is entirely the wrong career for you, uh, as ever I can quite listen. In the pandemic, Rishi Sunak took difficult but vital decisions. How many jobs would we have lost? How many businesses would not still be afloat had it not been for the furlough scheme that the IMF said was the best in the world? And character is also... <laughs> and character is also about the team you build around you, from William Hague and Michael Howard to some of the best of the 2019 intake here tonight. Rishi has understood one thing that we all should understand about our party, and that is we avoid external coalitions by maintaining an internal coalition. All our best leaders have understood that, and that is why we've been the most successful political party in the Western world. But there is one key issue that all of us need to think about tonight and in the next few weeks. I spent all of the 13 miserable years in opposition on the front bench I don't want to go back there. To win a general election, it's not about persuading people like me or you. It's actually about persuading those swing voters who we need to make a difference. And we will have to stop an SNP Labour coalition from literally tearing our nation apart if we don't win the next general election. We will need a leader and a prime minister with the right policies, yes, but with character, with courage, with experience and with intellect and the downright decency to swing those voters behind us and get them to vote Conservative. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, that that leader, that Prime Minister, will be Rishi Sunak. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's fantastic to be with you. It's also great to be out and about in the Southwest over the last couple of days, meeting all our members, having lots of conversations, and in fact, taking lots of selfies too. But I've got to be honest with you, I'm never happier when one of our members asks me to take a photo with one of their kids. Honestly, I think, finally, a photo with someone my own size. <laughs> But look, I'm here tonight, standing in front of you for one very simple reason. 
And that's because this country, our country, did something extraordinary for my family by welcoming them here as immigrants 60 years ago and allowing them to build a better life. Because that's what our amazing country does. Now, I was raised with a set of values that are core to who I am. And first among those is that family means everything to me. Because the bonds of family are far greater than anything any government could ever hope to replicate, and we must never, ever forget that. Now, in my, in my family, we prioritised hard work because that was the way that you forged ahead. My dad was an NHS GP. You might have heard that my mum ran a local chemist in Southampton. I spent my time working there, delivering medicines to people who couldn't get them in. But I also did her books, her payroll, her VAT, and saw the transformative opportunities that a small business like that could provide in our community. Now, for my parents, the way that they wanted to build a better future for their three children was simple. And it was through education. And I passionately believe, even now, that the best way to reduce inequality, the best way to spread opportunity, indeed, the best way to transform lives is through education. So that so those, in a nutshell, are my values. Patriotism, service, family, hard work, aspiration, and looking out at all of you, I'm sure they are your values too, because those are conservative values, and mine is a conservative story. That is why I want to be your next leader and next prime minister, because I want to translate those conservative values into action in government to build a better Britain. And with your support, I know that we can build a Britain where the birthright of every child is a world-class education. A Britain which leads the world in standards of integrity, decency and leadership. A Britain built on aspiration, hard work and hope. And a Britain where we can be enormously proud of our history and confident about our future. But before we get there, we have to tackle three immediate challenges. We have to restore trust. We have to rebuild the economy. And we have to reunite our country. Now, to restore trust, we have to start by being honest. And as you can see in this leadership race, I've not taken the easy path, because our country faces some challenges. And I want to be straight with all of you and the country about those and what is going to be required to grapple with them. It may not be easy, but it is honest, and that is what leadership is about. But we also restore trust by delivering on the things that matter to people. And that's why I've set out a plan to radically challenge consensus and reform the NHS so we can focus less on how much we put into it and more about what we get out of it and cut those backlogs. It's why I want to make sure that the government in Westminster understands the needs of rural communities like mine in North Yorkshire and yours here. And that means making sure our fields are used for food production and not solar panels. It means, it means prioritising our fishing communities. It means backing our farmers and food security. That's how you can store trust in the system. But crucially, that's why I've also set out a plan to finally grip and resolve the issue of illegal migration. Because for far too long, we have all watched those scenes on our TV screens, and it must stop. And with my plan, with radical measures, novel thinking, we will finally get to grips, resolve that problem, and have proper control of our borders, because that's how you restore trust back in the system. Now, now, when it comes to rebuilding the economy, you all know what the biggest challenge we face is, and that is inflation. And you also all know that inflation is the enemy that makes everyone poorer. It reduces living standards. It erodes people's hard-earned savings and pensions. 
it pushes up mortgage rates. And of course, I want to help people with the cost of living. And that's why this autumn, we will cut VAT on energy bills. But I'm not going to do things that risk making the problem far worse and last far longer. Especially if that means borrowing tens of billions of pounds in unfunded promises, which we just put on the country's credit card, and then ask our children and grandchildren to pick up the tab. But I am going to cut taxes, and that's why today I set out a radical set of reforms to cut the basic rate of income tax by a fifth under my leadership. Because as Conservatives, we believe in hard work. I want to reward hard work and allow people to keep more of their hard-earned money. So under me, income taxes will fall, and they will fall at the fastest rate since Nigel Lawson and Margaret Thatcher. But we're going to do that responsibly. We're not going to ask our kids to pay for it. We're going to do it by being tough on public spending, reforming public services, and by growing the economy. Because this autumn, I want to reform our business taxes. So we cut taxes for those businesses that are actually investing in the economy, that are growing the economy, that are innovating. And I want to take advantage of all our Brexit freedoms. As Chancellor, I embarked on a radical policy of free ports. We're going to have one in Plymouth. And you know why? Because levelling up is not just about the North, it's about the South West too. And I want to bring that same radicalism across government. I want to reform regulations in agriculture, in financial services, in data, in life sciences, so that we can make this the best country in the world for companies to start and grow. Because in a 21st century economy, that's what you need to do. And my experience means I am the best person to lead our economy into that future and seize the opportunities that are there waiting for us. But lastly, we have to reunite our country. And in just a couple of years, we have to do something that's never been done before. And that's to win a fifth election victory. We have to make British political history in doing that. But I know we can do it. I know we can do it working together. And you know where it starts? It starts with winning back Tiverton and Honiton. But that's not going to be enough. We need to appeal to swing voters everywhere. Here in the South West, in London, in Chesham and Amersham, in Brexit supporting Teesside, in Wales and in Scotland. And I passionately believe, and the evidence shows, that I am the candidate that gives our party the best opportunity of beating Keir Starmer and ensuring Labour never win that election. And in conclusion, I'll just say this. As Chancellor, you saw me in the pandemic. You saw me act boldly, radically, quickly, ripping up the rule book to ensure that we protected millions of jobs and businesses, supported the economy, made sure it was resilient, got through the worst recession in 300 years, and bounced back strongly on the other side. And as your Prime Minister, I will bring that same energy, that same grip to all the challenges that we face, tackling illegal migration, reforming our public services, growing our economy, putting those conservative values into action. And I also promise you this, I will give you my everything, my heart and soul, into making sure that each and every one of you here tonight can feel enormously proud of the Conservative government that I will be privileged to lead. So I humbly ask for your support, not just to be our next party leader, but also the next Prime Minister of our great country. Thank you.
Right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm back again, and we are now here for the fireside chat element, or maybe it should be a fire pit chat element, given that it is the summer here. Now, you've had lots to think about from those speeches there, some things you may have heard before, some new things as well. I want you to percolate on those questions while I'm having the, um, my moment with each of our candidates here. So when you do your questions, I'm sure you all want to ask about taxes, Europe, I have seen some Conservative Party events before, but maybe you could be a little bit more imaginative and think of some different potential topics, particularly with regards to the South West that we could talk about, but we'll come to that in about 10 minutes and you will see around the room some white hoodie people, if they could wave at one moment, you'll see where they'll be going around and they'll grab the questions when we come to that. But before all that, I'd like to be in with my bit where I get to chat the candidates, so please give a warm welcome to bring back to the stage the Right Honourable Liz Truss MP. Hello Liz, great to see you. So, shall we begin with your big new surprise endorsement that came this evening, Penny Mordant? And I think some people might have seen that and been perhaps a bit surprised, because I believe that some of your supporters were not the biggest fans of Penny Mordant. One of them, I think, has had grave reservations about her running for her candidacy. Another accused of maybe being a little bit work shy. Do you have any grave reservations about her? I think Penny Mordant is a brilliant person, a fantastic politician. She ran a brilliant leadership campaign. And I'm absolutely delighted that she's decided to back me and become part of my team. It's fantastic. And I think everybody around this room knows that we need all the best players on the pitch in the Conservative Party. You know, we need to win the next election. And what I am all about is making sure we unite the party, that we move forward with a really clear Conservative vision. And I'm absolutely delighted to have Penny on board. And of course, when you talk about players on the pitch in your potential future cabinet, may that include your other opponent, Rishi Sunak, if you are successful in this race. Well, I thought you were going to talk about the lionesses, Seb. When you started talking about players on the pitch, obviously they are they Are, are they in your cabinet as well? They are. Well, I'm, I'm huge fans of them, and I think they showed tremendous spirit last night. You know, when it was, it was, a, difficult, it was a difficult match. Of course, I would have Rishi Sunak as part of my team. He's a fantastic guy. We need all of our best talent on the pitch, and I have huge respect for him. Now, let's talk about your slogan, which is trusted to deliver. You've been in the cabinet since 2014. Since then, you've done lots of different portfolios. I think six cabinet jobs. Give me your Only five cabinet jobs, Seb. Oh, well, the next, one's, was the next one, one's the six. I was job. education minister. There I was we go. Education Not minister. quite there yet. But <laughs> give me your top three policy domestic achievements from that era, from those roles? So, lots of people said, after we left the EU, that we wouldn't be able to get as good trade deals as the EU had. In fact, I got all of them in record time, and I got an even better deal with Japan, new deals with Australia and New Zealand, started off the process of India, started off the process of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and I'm very proud of what we achieved at the Department of Trade, we showed the massive opportunities there were after Brexit. And what I want to do as Prime Minister is be able to unleash the full opportunities, things like Solvency II, Mifid, changing our procurement laws so they're fair for British companies. And I think, so that would be a huge achievement. I, well, one, of the things, one of the things that makes me proudest is the work I did to secure the release of Nazanin and Anusha. Nazanin had been in jail in Iran on and off for six years. And again, I was told that this would be difficult, that this would be impossible. But I found a new way of doing things. I worked with the team at the Foreign Office and we succeeded in bringing her and Anusha home. And I just remember waiting at Bryce Norton in the middle of the night and her coming off the plane to see her young daughter and husband. And that was one of the best moments of my life. Seeing, seeing, her, seeing her and her family. And you know, that, that is why I'm in politics, to make a difference. I really felt on that occasion I made a difference. And the third thing I would highlight is the work I've done on the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. 
Again, people said that this was a difficult challenge, that I'd been handed a poison chalice. I got it just before Christmas, and I did say to David Frost, thanks for the Christmas present, David. Uh, you've given me the whole Christmas to spot up on these negotiations. And you know, we didn't get where we wanted with the EU, and peace in Northern Ireland is incredibly important to me. The Belfast Good Friday Agreement is incredibly important. I remember what it was like before that agreement was done, and how the troubles in Northern Ireland you know, affected all of us. All of us, they are part of our family. So sorting out that has been really important. Getting the support of that bill in Parliament. Again, lots of people said it would be impossible, that Parliament wouldn't support it, that they made claims it was illegal, but it's not illegal. It's absolutely right that we protect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of our country and that we protect the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Now, on the, <laughs> on the latter point about the Northern Ireland Protocol situation, now that bill is making its way through Parliament at the moment, would you have any reservations at all in triggering those measures to collapse part of the protocol, given the fact we could see a retaliation from the EU, we've got a cost of living crisis, inflation is going to be rampant. If they were then to raise trade tariffs, that could make the situation a lot worse. Well, they would be completely wrong to do this, because the way we have done the bill is to create a green and a red channel, which helps protect the European single market at the same time as protecting trade between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. And that is vitally important. Currently, the Belfast Good Friday Agreement is being undermined. The relations between East and West are being undermined. And I will not allow that to happen under my watch. I will proceed with the bill. I've always been clear that I would rather get a negotiated solution with the EU. But I think we've learned from history that there's only one thing the EU understands, and that is strength. And I am strong enough to make this happen. Now, we talked about Trinton and Honiton, which of course is just 15 miles up the road from here, and you said that you're the candidate who can win, I think, the Blue Wall, the Red Wall, and Cornwall, you said as well. But that was a silly pun. I apologise for my, for my dad jokes. I'm sure the Cornish people here will <laughs> forgive you one day. But there is polling out that suggests if you were facing Kiasama in a general election, you would lose. So what evidence have you got, having never fought a national campaign, that you can win well, back I've seen, the Blue I've seen the opposite polls, which said I would win uh, against Keir Starmer. In fact, one out today, one out today, one out today saying I'm more popular as Prime Minister than Keir Starmer. But one thing I don't believe in, and I frankly think there's too much of it been going on under successive Prime Ministers, is worrying about polls, worrying about focus groups. What we need to do as Conservatives, we need to do what's right. We need to do what is right for people. We need to deliver on our promises. And that is why we will gain their trust and deliver the next election. So the idea we should just be looking for the Seb Payne column in the Financial Times and be worrying about the polls. We shouldn't be worrying about that. We should be worrying about delivering broadband and a mobile phone signal here in Devon. We should be worried about making sure our farmers can produce fantastic beef. You know, we should be worried about facing down Vladimir Putin and ensure the Ukrainians win. That's what we should care about. And one thing I would do is, is Alistair Campbell moved the chief whip out of number 12 Downing Street and he moved the press office in. Just to show you my priorities, I'm going to move the chief whip back in and I'm going to move the press office out. Because my priority... not the worst, he's one of the nice ones, he's one of the nice ones, um, but, but my, <laughs> my, my priority is delivering what the public have voted for in line with our conservative values of rewarding people who work hard, do the right thing, set up businesses, you know, those are the people that I am working for, not the press, not the pollsters, not the media. Now.
we are, if you become Prime Minister, we are obviously going to face a very difficult six months ahead with obviously the potential energy price cap going to be raised and um, inflation is still going to be very high. And one thing that we've seen is a growing move of civil disobedience. There's a campaign called Don't Pay. There's people saying they're going to refuse to pay their energy bills later this year. What would be your policy response to that? Well, my response on energy, yes, it is partly fracking. And we should allow, we should allow fracking. Uh, we, should, we should allow fracking. We should allow fracking where local communities support it. And you say things will take a long time. They will take less time under my government because I will pass primary legislation to get things done. The fact is road projects, rail projects, infrastructure projects are taking too long in this country. They go through too many phases. The planning system is too slow. We need to get on and we need space in the ground before the next election. And I'm determined to use our majority in Parliament to deliver that. I also, well, I, I am getting on with your question. Uh, the, <laughs> I will also make sure we exploit all of the gas in the North Sea and we make sure we use that to bolster our domestic energy supply. I'll move forward faster with nuclear, uh, including major nuclear stations, but also small modular reactors, which are produced in Derby and a major, a major opportunity for our country as well. And what I am immediately announcing is having a moratorium on the green energy levy, which will immediately save money on people's bills, as well as immediately reducing people's taxes. Because I believe it is completely wrong that at this time, when families are struggling with fuel bills, that we have put up their taxes. I spoke out against it at Cabinet at the time. I'm still, I'm still against it. I mean, on the issue of civil disobedience more generally, I am concerned about militant trade unions. I will root out the trade union time wasting that is currently going on Whitehall at the taxpayers' expense. And I will also legislate to make sure we protect essential services, including essential use of our railways. It's completely wrong that people who work hard are penalised and can't get into work. Meanwhile, train drivers who are already very well paid are causing havoc. Now, we've only got a few minutes left before. We have a few minutes left before we go back to the audience that come to my favourite part, which is the quick fire personal round here. <laughs> Liz Trust, which opposition politician do you admire the most? Um, I, I think Rosie Duffield, because she stood up against the ludicrous lobby in the Labour Party who deny the fact that women are women, and she's been prepared to stand up for her beliefs. Number two. Are you a person of faith and do you practice religion regularly? So I, I share the values of the Christian faith in the Church of England, but I'm not a regularly practicing uh, religious person. What's the one public perception about you that is most wrong? They're all true. <laughs> what is the best non-political book you've read recently? I do like Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. There we are. If you weren't a politician, what would you be? Um. <laughs> Someone's going to have to drive me. Um. Believe me, it would be less stress and probably, probably more money as well. But uh, the, what would I be? I actually absolutely love food, so I'd love to be a food critic and a food writer. So. And finally, do you have any doubts about your ability to fulfil the role of Prime Minister? No, I don't. I've, I've been Foreign Secretary, I've been Trade Secretary, I've held other roles in the Cabinet. I know there will be tough times, but I also know that I can deal with difficult situations, I can get the job done, and I'm completely determined and resolute. And one last bonus one, um, without thinking of fields of wheat too much, what is the most embarrassing thing you've ever done? I mean, honestly, yes. my, my daughters will be watching this, and I absolutely am not going to say. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, it's just 
thank you so much for being such a good sport. Now let's go to audience questions. If you look around, you will see people in the white hoodies who've got the microphones. So if you want to raise your hand, we'll try and get through as many of them as we can. Uh, let's go to the gentleman here uh, in the uh, blue shirt. Can you just tell us your name, please? Thank you. Uh, my name is John Levinson. And as many, many uh, members of the party across the country live in the countryside, and many of all party members would like to know if you will allow government time within this part, current parliament to repeal that dreadful 2005 Hunting Act, which is divisive and does nothing for animal welfare and is, uh, poorly affects the rural economy. You might, know, you might know that I'm an MP in Norfolk, which is a fantastic place for country sports. We have a very strong shooting industry. I'm very, very supportive of country sports. But I remember being a minister under David Cameron's government and looking at this issue, and I think opening Pandora's box could possibly make the situation worse for people who enjoy country sports. So whilst I share uh, your love of rural pastimes and I'm a strong supporter of all of the you know, fantastic conservation work uh, the shooting industry does. I, I think we've got to be very careful about opening that box. Thank you. Are you happy with that answer, sir? <laughs> never mind. Mike you'll always, what, what I would say about me is you'll always get an honest answer and I will never make promises I can't keep. And I've never made promises in any job I've done that I can't follow through on. And I know, I've been there, I know how difficult that one is. Right, let's get some more questions. Uh, let's get the gentleman here with the, with the white shirt, thank you. Yes. I, I think it was two days ago, Liz, you mentioned, I think, in an article in the Daily Telegraph, sorry, um, that, uh, <laughs> that um, you, you were more interested in levelling up in the rural community than perhaps other people have mentioned in the past. We are, my friend and I, are from the farthest west constituency, and we call it St. Ives, but we prefer it in West Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly. If, if you'd come here today by train, it would have taken you two hours from London, or it would have taken me three hours from Penzance. When are we going to get the kind of infrastructure investment that makes our lives on equal terms to the rest of the country? There we are. More trains in the southwest. at the moment is the Treasury Green Book has this thing called a benefit cost ratio and essentially what it means is that if you already have a lot of infrastructure and capital you get more. So this is why more and more tube lines end up getting built in London while cities get the fibre roll out first. I don't believe that is what we should be doing. I want to rip up that rule book and change it. Because I think it's important to help those communities with the worst infrastructure first. So my policy would be helping rural areas level up and get that infrastructure. And we know, and if you want to be a farmer now or you want to run a small business in Devon or Cornwall, you need the internet. It's not an optional service. You need it. And it's, you can't even get a mobile phone signal in vast swathes of the area. So, but the thing about me is I am prepared to challenge the orthodoxy. And this, these rules have not changed for years. They haven't changed under... Wait a minute, that's not quite true. Rishi Sunak ripped up the Green Book a couple of years ago when he was So why hasn't it changed? Because I haven't seen any change in the last two and a half years, Sebastian. I, you know, I'm in a rural constituency too. I've been campaigning for an upgrade in my train line for the last 15 years, and it is simply not happening. And it is because the rules are still not right. Well, here's a question for you. One of your previous contenders, Kemi Badenoch, talked about breaking up the Treasury. Do you think the Treasury should be broken up? Well, I wouldn't want to give them any advance warning. Uh, if, I, if, I, if I was going to do that. But I do, I do think the Treasury needs to change. And it has been a block on progress. You know, why haven't we got things like Solvency 2 and MIFID changed? These are the things that would unleash investment, including into our rural communities in the southwest. We haven't changed them since Brexit, 
and we need to get on with it. And this is partly about challenging not just the Treasury orthodoxy, but the Whitehall orthodoxy in getting things done. And I'm prepared to break all eggs to make the omelette. There you are. Five of the people in the Treasury who enjoy breakfast. Now, let's go over here. There's a lady just here who's sticking her hands up. She just, um, I think you might have a green top on there. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Lavinia Carey, I'm from um, South Somerset. Um, where does all the money come from? Where's all the money going to come from? I mean, there's some great promises, some great pledges, and some things I totally, totally believe in, especially helping people who are struggling. But where is the money going to come from that isn't going to put us into debt? So Thank you very much. The answer is the money, the money is going to come from thriving enterprises, thriving businesses, and economic growth. That is where we as Conservatives believe that money comes from, and that's how we have a successful, prosperous country. And the fact is, if we tax businesses too much, if we tax people too much, and we've currently got the highest tax rates for 70 years in our country, we will throttle that growth. And we're currently predicted to have a recession next year. So my view is business as usual, carrying on with these high taxes, raising taxes on corporations, which is the proposal uh, currently, will throttle off growth and it will mean less money coming into the exchequer and less revenue coming to government. I mean, look, Gordon Brown makes a very good argument from a Labour point of view for high tax and spend. But my view is that is not a Conservative policy. We believe in enterprise. We believe in people keeping more of their own money. We believe in rewarding people who work hard and do the right thing. And we're currently, if you look at our debt levels, our debt levels are lower than the debt levels of Canada, than the debt, le debt levels of Japan, than the de debt levels of the United States. And we've just been through a major economic shock. I think it is a mistake to try and pay it all back next year and balance the books and completely throttle our economy. And no other, no other G7 country is doing that. No other country is raising taxes at the moment. Are you at all concerned, though, that I think it was page seven of the 2019 Conservative Manifesto said that debt would be lower at the end of the part of the beginning? Of course, we've been through the COVID pandemic that has raised debt quite significantly, but this does feel like not the sort of thing the Liz Truss of the Cameron government, where I recall the, the long-term economic plan, bringing down the deficit. That was your message then. Does ramping up the debt not concern you at all? Well, I was a loyal part of the Cameron government. I don't necessarily agree with absolutely everything. Absolutely, everything so was that strategy wrong? No, I, there were good elements to the strategy, but I think we should have done more long-term reform, particularly in things like social care. I think it was wrong to cut the social care budget, and then we're now suffering the consequences of that. So not everything the government does is perfect, and not everything every government does is perfect. But what we're facing with COVID is a one in a hundred year event. You know, the Second World War was a major event. We didn't suddenly decide we had to pay back all the debt the next week. So I don't, I don't agree with this argument that we have to pay back the very high cost of COVID, harming ordinary people who are currently struggling with fuel bills and, fu and food bills, and also making our economy uncompetitive. So what we're currently talking about is raising our corporation tax to 10 basis points higher than Ireland's, and the same level as France's. And I don't think that is what we want a post-Brexit competitive Britain to look like. What I want to do, you know, and of course, of course, Sebastian, I want to reform the public sector. And I'm going to lay out a 10-year plan of how we get rid of lots of quangos, we've got 500 of them, how we slim down Whitehall, how we cut out bureaucracy. But I'm a realist, I recognize this takes time. At the same time, we need to unleash the potential in our economy. And we haven't done enough yet. And I've talked about fisheries, I've talked about food and farming, I've talked about infrastructure. These are all things we need to get on delivering because the fact is we've had low growth for two decades. And simply carrying on with the same policy is going to result in more low growth. So my vision is bold, it is different, 
but it is needed. And I believe that people voted Conservative in 2019 because they wanted something new. They didn't want more of the same. Right, I'm going to turn around behind you now to try and get some people here. Uh, it's good for the gentleman just down here at the front. I think he's wearing a potentially a black jumper, or it could be blue, depending on the lights here. Thank you very much. Um, Jason Woolacock from Taunton D. Uh, my question is about the online safety bill, which is slightly different. So, uh, as Kemi Baddock said, it's not fit for purpose and a danger to free speech. Uh, what is your opinion of that? Yes, would you scrap the online safety bill? Well, what, what I believe about online safety is we do need to protect the under 18s from some of the content online. I have a 16-year-old daughter and a 13-year-old daughter, and frankly, I'm worried about some of the stuff they see. I'm also worried about young teenagers being on social networking sites. And we know it has had a bad effect, particularly on girls' mental health. So I think we do need to do more to tackle those issues online. But when people are grown adults, I do believe they should be able to speak freely. I do believe they should be able to freely communicate. And I will make sure that we do what we need in the online harms bill to make sure we're not affecting free speech and we're defending free speech. But I think it is important that we do protect the under 18. So you would be amending the online harms bill as it currently stands to change those elements to do with things that... I will be making sure that it protects free speech. Right, should we just try and get and some... And I will be engaging with all my friends in the Conservative Party to make sure they're happy as well. Right, let's... Including, including the gentleman in the indeterminate... Jump. Yes, exactly. Um, have we got any more ladies? I'm just seeing we've got any questions up here. Now, there's a lady over there. there is a lady. Lady, exactly. Let's see. Um, there was, I think there was someone just there. Thank you very much. Um, exactly. Um, sorry. Oh, yeah. That, uh, lady, uh, that one there. That's perfect. Thank you. Um, can I just ask you if you would ever authorise another lockdown? No. No. I wouldn't. Do you regret any of your support for the three lockdowns within government? Because, of course, there's been many policy areas that you were part of the government at, the national insurance rise, for example, which you've now come out against. So, privately, do you think lockdown was a bad idea? Well, every single chance I was given the opportunity to express a view, I was on the favour of doing less rather than more on lockdowns and opening up the economy earlier. The fact is I wasn't part of the key COVID committee. I was the International Trade Secretary, I was spending my time trying to get all these trade deals done. Uh, I wasn't really a core part of that COVID decision making and often, frankly, it was presented as a fait accompli, uh, as the French would say, to the, to the wider cabinet. And look, when I have objected to government policy in the case of national insurance, I did so in cabinet at the time. I said it would be a mistake to raise taxes. I said we didn't need to, we could afford it within our current spending envelope, under my plans that it will still be the case that debt is falling within three years, and I thought it was a mistake at the time. But I, I'm a loyal person, I respect cabinet collective responsibility, and governments don't work if everybody's just talking off, offline all the time. I know it makes you happy as a journalist said when people sort of leak stuff to you, but I can tell you one of my criteria for the people who would be in my cabinet if I was Prime Minister, is I don't want people who leak and brief. I want people who have those discussions internally and then, and then behave, behave, um, behave properly externally. Uh, I could tell you the two other criteria as well, if you like. Yeah, please do. I'm one is they've, they've, got to have, they've got to have conservative views, and the second is they've got to be able to get things done and challenge the orthodoxy. Right, I want to get one last final question in. Uh, let's go for... Oh, sorry, should we go on this side? Apologies. Who was, who was shouting on this side? All right. I'll go for this gentleman down here at the front. Hi, Mario Rossi from Dalwoton in Somerset. What are you going to do to get Scotland on board? Because I'm sick to death hearing about Nicola Sturgeon trying to break up the union. <laughs> this gentleman... Hazard, the bonds of the United Kingdom have weakened over the past 12 years of Conservative government. And if you look at the Northern Ireland or Scotland, independence is very much um, a question again. And you know, what is your plan to reverse that? Um, 
I, I don't think you are planning to build any walls. No, I, was, I, was, I went to primary school in Paisley in Scotland, and I went to secondary school, and you did too. Maybe you were in the same class. Anyway, um, I, and I feel like I'm the child of the uni, that I really believe we are a family, and we're better together. And I think the best thing to do with Nicola Sturgeon is ignore her. I think she's... I think I'm sorry, she's an attention seeker, Sarah. That's what she is. And what we need to do is show the people of Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales what we are delivering for them and making sure that all of our government policies apply right across the United Kingdom. You know, I was very proud to lift the whiskey tax and I don't think I've ever been more popular than I was in Mabler's Bar in Edinburgh. The, the night that I was there with a bunch of whiskey distillers, he said this has made a huge biz difference to their business. They know it was now 25% cheaper for them to export their fantastic whiskey to the United States. And that is the kind of thing we need to be there. We need to be showing what we're delivering. And you know, Nicholas Sturgeon can sort of carry on talking about an independence referendum. We had the referendum in 2014. It was agreed it was once in a generation. I didn't, I didn't realise a generation happened within 10, 10 years. That doesn't make any sense. sense. So, so we've got to call her out on that, but at the same time, really delivering for Scotland. So, so some, some of the policies I'm talking about, the investment zones, the free ports, we need to make sure they're delivered in Scotland too. That's an absolute no to another independent no, referendum, whenever you no, are, Prime no. Minister. There you are. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much no, for those. Thank you so much for all those questions, everyone. I'm sorry we didn't get to more of them, but thank you um, very much for putting those forward. And please stand, Liz Truss. So we now have a little bit of changeover um, as we have obviously um, our next candidate. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, please give a very large round of applause for the Right Honourable Rishi Sunak MP. Thank you very much. Well, welcome, Mr. Sunak, back to the stage. Um, let's begin with your big announcement, which was on the front page of many newspapers today, about, uh, about tax cuts. Some point in the future, when you launched your leadership campaign, you said that the Conservative Party faced a choice between reality and fairy tale economics. Now, what's not fairy tale about a tax cut six years away that's predicated on a fifth general election victory you said was going to be a historic problem? Well, the, the, the difference, difference is, is, my plan is one that is one that's paid for, and that's the big difference, and it's one that comes in after we've got a grip of inflation. Now, this is not something I've just come up with today. As Chancellor, I put in place a tax strategy which will deliver in this Parliament the first income tax cut that we've had in almost 16 years in this country, and that was in my plans, and I paid for it by making sure that we're going to be controlled with public spending and that we're going to grow the economy. And as Prime Minister, I want to go further than that and keep cutting income tax, because it's the best demonstration we have as a party to the working people of this country that we're on their side, that we want them to work hard and we want to reward that hard work and put more money in their pockets. That's what Conservative governments do, and that's what I'm going to deliver. Now, what, why did this idea just come at this point in the campaign? Because some of your opponents have said that you've done screeching U-turns, flip-flopping, because you announced the VAT energy cut last week, this tax cut now. At the beginning of this campaign, you weren't really thinking about this sort of thing. What changed? When you say the beginning of this campaign, sir, this campaign's only just getting started, right? It's like a little longer, I think. <laughs> so, I mean, we've got weeks of this. The balance are just only arriving this week, right? So let's not get carried away. We're, we're right at the beginning of this thing. Now, we have to differentiate two things. How do we help people in the southwest and across the country with the immediate challenges they're facing with the cost of living? And in that context, it's absolutely right 
that we go further than I announced as Chancellor because the situation has changed. The energy bills are going to be higher. And the easiest thing we can do at this point, given we're pretty close to the autumn, is to cut VAT on fuel. That's why I'm going to do that. But that's temporary and for a specific purpose. That's very different from me standing up here and promising all of you 30, 40, I think at last count, 50 billion pounds worth of permanent unfunded tax cuts because that isn't conservative and that would be risky in the environment that we're in. So it's right to provide short-term help for people with a cost of living, but it's also right to give all of you in the country a sense of where I want to take the economy. And where I want to take it is in a direction where we're being disciplined on public services, we're reforming them, not just putting more cash into them, we're growing the economy by doing radically things differently with business taxation and Brexit opportunities, and then we're using that growth to cut taxes responsibly and over time and cut income tax because we want to reward hard work. That's my plan. In this contest, Rishi Sunak, would you describe yourself as a change or continuity candidate? And are you a doomster or a gloomster at all, as you're queued by your successor in the Treasury, I believe? Well, look, I, I, I'm definitely the change candidate. And the reason is, if you look at my political career, well, you said I was in Boris Johnson's government, right? I mean, but, I mean remember, Liz is, I think, the longer serving cabinet minister in the, ca in the cabinet at the moment, and she was in the cabinet before I was even an MP. So it's hard to say I'm the one that's been around a long time. But in any case, look, if you look at my political career, at the crunch moments when we have thought about doing things differently, where have I been? When it came to the Brexit referendum, when I was told that my career would be over before it had begun, when we did have a bunch of doomster predictions, yep, which I remember certain people were campaigning on, where was I on that divide? I supported change. I supported Brexit. And I believe in my principles then, and I believe in my principles now. Now, one of the policies you put forward um, quite recently was to do with house building. And essentially, you said we're not going to be building houses on the Greenbelt. Now, my generation, and it's quite hard to believe they're still, still vaguely young, but uh, the under 35 generation are really struggling to buy houses. And fundamentally, this is a supply problem. And doesn't your policy, which has been criticised by some centre right think tanks, just make the supply problem even worse? How are people of my generation ever going to buy a house under Prime Minister Sunak? Well, first of all, it's absolutely right, and there'll be people in this audience who want to do that. And many of us sitting here tonight will remember what it feels like. We remember how magical it was when we got that set of keys to our first flat or house. And then we started to improve it and make it our own. We maybe got married and built our family there. That is an incredibly conservative dream that we need to fulfill. And right now, too many young people can't do it. So it's absolutely right to ask the question. Because if we are going to protect our green spaces and we're not going to impose top-down planning targets on our local authorities, how are we going to do it? Well, we need to do a few things. We need to make sure we unlock brownfield land across the country. There are about a million homes that we can build on brownfield. Indeed, one of those centre-right think tanks you mentioned wrote a very good report about that. So if the government steps in to remediate that land, we can build houses there. The second thing we need to do is in our urban areas, largely often controlled by labour authorities, they're not building enough. Our urban areas are not dense enough if you look at our cities versus all European cities, so we can improve it there. And then the third thing we need to do in terms of supply is something that isn't particularly British sounding, and that's more flat pack housing. And the reality is most other advanced countries use modular housing, and they do it because it is high quality, it is faster, and it is cheaper. Now, lastly, because I know this is an important question, so I'm going to give you an extra bit of detail. It's not just about supply, because that will help. But what I know many of you in this audience will have is children or grandchildren who have a great job and actually have a great credit history because they've been paying rent. And they could actually afford the mortgage payments. And in fact, the mortgage payments may even be lower than their rent payments. But what they don't have is the money for the big deposit because it now takes just far too long to save up for that deposit. So as Chancellor, I created a new 95% mortgage for first-time buyers, and it's working really well. It's getting young people on the housing ladder, and as Prime Minister, I want to turbocharge that policy, because if we can work with the banks and make that new first-time buyer mortgage work, it means young people can get on the housing ladder and have that magical feeling that we all had when we got our first home. That's what I want to do. 
Now, I want to put to you uh, the same question I put to Lisa earlier about Tipton and Honiton, just 15 miles up the road here, because that by-election loss was a historic loss for the Conservative Party, and I think, much like your opponent, you've also said you're the only candidate who can win the blue wall and the red wall. Again, you've not led and fought a national election campaign before. What is the evidence you can win back Tipton and Honiton? Well, well, first, first of all, I, I'm sure there are a lot of people here in the audience who are campaigning there, and I came down to support you. Can I just say thank you to you? Because you guys did an extraordinary job in very difficult circumstances from Westminster, and actually we all owe you an enormous vote of thanks, quite frankly. So first of all, thank you for that. So, look, when it comes back to winning Tivert and Honton, there's the immediate issue of fixing the school, and that's one that we'll need to get on and deliver at some point soon, because I think people want to see change there. But more broadly, if you look at rural areas, you look at liberal-leaning areas, what is it we need to do? Well, look, I, like many of you, I live in an incredibly rural part of the country, and rural communities have particular challenges. You know, whether it's bus services, whether it's getting broadband out to rural communities to spread opportunity, whether it's making transport infrastructure work properly, and whether, as I discussed earlier, it's about backing farmers and making sure the trade deals we sign are not quote-unquote, one-sided, as the NFU de 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 decried one of our trade deals, but actually work for British farmers. So we need to get the rural community to, first of all, realise that they can trust a Conservative government, and everything about my background could tell you that I will deliver that. But I think also what we need to do is just improve the conduct of government. And in areas like this, when I was knocking on doors and I was speaking to people, what people did not like, that in their view, government was not run properly, it was not run seriously, and it was not run with decency and integrity. And that is the change that I want to bring as Prime Minister. The name you didn't mention there, of course, is Boris Johnson, who was Prime Minister. Um, and I think you may be saying that essentially some of the issues with his government are the reason you've lost that by-election. You've said that you've explained the ethical problems that you had towards the end of that government, but also disagreements in fiscal policy. So why didn't you quit earlier? Because I instinctively wanted to try and make it work. I wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt for as long as I could. And I wanted to keep serving the British people. But it got to a point where the government found itself on the wrong side of yet another ethical divide that was hard for me to defend, combined with my well-documented differences on economic policy. And so, along with 60 other members of parliament, I took the difficult decision to leave government, because I thought that both our party and our country deserve better, and that's the change that we now need to bring. Now, just before we come to the personal quick fire round, you mentioned trade deals before, and there's been some commentary, I think, from sort of people allied to your campaign about, um, about the Australia trade deal, which had particular things to do with farmers, and saying that this shows Liz Truss's Remainer roots, um, which I think was probably quite a surprising thing to people who've seen what Liz Truss has been saying about Brexit. But do you think it's a problem with the trade deals we've negotiated in terms of agriculture, and would you like to overturn the trade deal with Australia because it's not good enough for farmers? Well, we, we can't rip up treaties that we've, that we've already signed with these countries. Countries, but what the lesson we need to learn is that we shouldn't be rushing to sign trade deals as quickly as possible. We should be taking the time to get them right, and we should make sure that they work for British farmers. It's not rocket science in that regard, because our farming communities are incredibly important to our country. I see that every week when I go home to North Yorkshire. My neighbour is a dairy farmer. The NFU tells me I represent more farmers than any other constituency, and I certainly represent more sheep than people where I am. So this is something that I acutely feel every week. And I want to make sure that we run a government that is respectful of rural communities, that's supporting them, that is prioritising food security and food production and backing our farmers. That's here at home and it's with trade deals and that's the change that I will bring. Right, now let's do the quick fire question round before we get out to questions from the members here. So the same ones that I asked Elizabeth, was, which opposition politician do you admire the most? Oh gosh, right. Um, well, I, I, I probably let's try not damn them by outing them now. So rather than give you one who is currently there, I'll give you my favourite one that is no longer with us, and that's Hugh Gateskill. And uh, he was a Labour Chancellor in the 50s. And a former Wickhamist as well. So, so, uh, there we go. So he was at the same school as me. I have a picture of him up in my uh, in study when I was in Downing Street alongside Nigel Lawson and, and uh, William Gladstone. The reason I chose Gateskill, because even though he was a Labour Chancellor, uh, here are some of his policy positions. Uh, while the Labour Party wanted to ban the bomb and do nuclear disarmament, he was in favour of the nuclear deterrent. 
well before Tony Blair thought about it, he wanted to abolish Clause 4. Uh, and then also, while the rest of the Labour Party was uh, headlong into more European integration, he remained very sceptical of the European project. So as far as Labour politicians go, I thought he was pretty sound. Yeah. <laughs> Number two, are you a person of faith and do you practice religion re regularly? Yes and yes. I'm a Hindu, I'm a practicing Hindu, and uh, that's how we've raised our kids. And uh, as I was saying, just a few weeks ago, I was back at my temple in Southampton where I grew up, because every year we have a family prayer day where we cook lunch and serve it to the community, and it was a very special part of how I was brought up, and it's a special part of how I live my life today. Number, <laughs> Number three, what is the one public perception about you that is most wrong? You know, it's what you touched on before, about it's this idea of continuity versus change. And, you know, actually, I've spent my life wanting to do things differently. I'm not in this just to manage things. I'm in this to radically transform things. And we talked about that with Brexit, where I took the side of the argument was about doing something brave, doing something different, being bold. You saw that from me during the pandemic. I ripped up the rule book in a matter of weeks to design programs, interventions, policies that this country had never seen before and made sure that we protected people's jobs and businesses. When it came to the lockdown that people wanted to do last Christmas with Omicron, I came back from a business trip abroad and I wanted to stop that from happening and I'm glad I did with others make sure that we didn't walk into another lockdown that could have needlessly damaged. Thank you, the country. And, and, if you look at, and if you look at my plans going forward, yes, of course I want to be responsible in managing inflation. That's a sensible conservative thing to do. But gosh, do I want to be radical about how we grow this economy as Chancellor I set up free ports. It's one of the few things visibly that we can see as a benefit from Brexit. I want to reform financial services regulation. I want to make sure this is the best place in the world to innovate. I want to reform the corporate tax system. And actually, hopefully, we'll get onto this in the Q&A. Liz Truss's policies on corporate taxation are exactly the failed Treasury orthodoxy of the last 10 years, which hasn't worked. I want to change it and grow the economy. This is the first time. This is the first time. Um, Four, what is the best non-political book you've read recently? Oh, uh, well, actually, I reread I reread one of my favourite books with my kids, and that was Going Solo by Roald Dahl. Uh, if you weren't a politician, what would you be? Ooh, uh, well, my, well, no, well, my bucket list of life's ambitions. Well, when I was a kid, I wanted to be in a Star Wars movie, um, so that's probably not a sensible thing to do. But I'm a massive football fan. I'm from Southampton, and if I would get to be able to run Southampton football... Oh, wow, is there a Saints fan here? Yeah. Look at that. Brilliant. Well, it's three of them. Amazing. Well, if I could run Southampton Football Club, I would be a very happy man. Do you have any doubt about your ability to fulfil the role of Prime Minister? No, I wouldn't be sitting here if I did, right? I mean, obviously, these are difficult jobs. Obviously, we face challenging times. But I would have not put myself forward and asked all of you to support me if I didn't think that I was up to the task of meeting those challenges and leading our country forward to a brighter future. I passionately believe that I can do that. I can do it all for you very well. And most importantly, I can go and smash Keir Starmer and the Labour Party and the Liberals at the next election. Finally, our last... And finally, our last quickfire question. What is the most embarrassing thing you've ever done? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, well, certainly, uh, recently, some of you might have seen that I, I struggled to pay for petrol in a car that wasn't mine. Um, so, uh, not, not a mistake that I'll make again. <laughs> it's contactless car now for paying for petrol. It's amazing. You, uh, it's, I'm telling you, this technology these days, it's amazing. Exactly. There we go. Right, now let's open some questions from the audience. Once again, you can see the people with the white hoodies and we'll get round. And I'm going to start over here because I didn't come over this end last time. Oh, yes, I'll do, I'll do my best, don't worry. Um, <laughs> we, um, could we go to this lady? Glad you're heckling him, here. not me. Yet. Exactly. <laughs> this here, thank you. Lady with the glasses, thank you. Uh, I come from West Dorset. And we, have, we don't have a very big population. And so your criteria of value for money when it comes to transport and infrastructure, we, we don't hit that target. So what will you do for West Dorset for buses? This is the Green Book question, Mr Sunak, about the fact that for many years the Treasury's formula for deciding where money should go has always favoured London and the South East. So what would you do to help West Dorset? Yes. Well, look, you, if you don't mind, I'm going to stand so I can just see all of you. So you're actually right about rural communities. And it's not just about transport, actually. It's about schools as well. So like you, I represent an area where you have dozens and dozens of very small 
village primary schools, right? And the funding formula for those doesn't work properly because it assumes that they can all be bigger and more efficient, but that doesn't work when you're trying to deal with four-year-olds. So you're right that we need to make sure our funding formulas deal with rural areas. And I've, I've already started to change that when I was local government minister for local council funding for things like social care. Uh, transportation as well, actually. We do it in a way that is better. And we need to do it more for schools. We made half of the progress before, and I'd like to finish the job. So your broader point is absolutely right. And if there are things to change, of course I'll change them, because I represent a rural area like yours. And we need to make sure that the voice of rural Britain is heard loudly and clearly down in Westminster, because not often they get it wrong. So, yeah. Right, let's go to this side of the audience now. Right. The gentleman here uh, with well, the three of us. Oh, there's actually actually there's three gentlemen. Oh, that, we've got this one. This man stood up. So let's go for him. That's why it's like Bobby in the House of Commons. Right. Yes. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> if you tell us your name as well, please. Uh, hello, my name is Guy Kirkwood. I'm a farmer from Tavistock. Well, my question is not about farming. Um, there are 32% of the workforce in the UK is now working in the public service in government, 32 per cent. But we're seeing an increase in, uh, in backlogs and a decrease in efficiencies. In the US, in the United States, they've started using something called um, software automation, and they've achieved $12 billion in savings and saved millions of hours of work. Will you support and mandate the use of such technologies if you become public? Slimming yeah. down the public sector so there. This, uh, you, you are absolutely right. And I, I think mandating is probably a strong word. But when I talk about being bold and reforming public services, that's exactly what we need to do. And that's what my background will put me in great place to actually do for all of us. And the first place we need to do it actually is with the NHS. Because right now we've got this massive problem with the backlog. And as they've already done in some trusts, we can use software automation and AI to massively rip through all the triaging and processing of them and clear up the list, and that's going to improve processing time. I tell you the other thing, though. We need to be bolder. Because if we're going to reform public services, we can't just sit on our hands. We need to be prepared to do some things differently. And this is about the radicalism I was talking about before, which is why, actually, for too long, all of you know, millions and millions of people miss their hospital and GP appointments. And it's wrong because they're depriving people of the care that they need. And actually, I'm prepared to be tough on that for the first time, because if we can reduce the number of missed appointments, have people cancel them in advance, without spending a penny more of any of your money, we've suddenly created lots more health care for everyone. So that's the kind of reforming zeal that I will bring to it, and the technology will absolutely be at the heart of that. Thank you. Right, let's go over this direction here. Um, gentlemen, on the end, just here. Right, who have we got? Jeremy Robinson from Ashburn, not too far from here. Um, one thing that uh, neither you or Liz Truss have mentioned at any point that I can recall is mental health. Now, I have a 16-year-old daughter who four years ago we suspected, or the doctors suspected, she may have autism. We tried to get some diagnosis, and we were told it would take at least two years to see somebody to get a diagnosis. Now, for a, a child, that's appalling. We were in the fortunate position that we could go privately. She was diagnosed with autism. She had to come out of mainstream schooling. Four years ago, since then, we've been unable to get any support for her or our family. Now, we're lucky we can afford some private help, but what about the vast majority of people who cannot afford to get private diagnosis, private help? What will you do for mental health in particular for children. Well, Je Jeremy, my, my two girls are a little bit younger than yours, so I can imagine how difficult and challenging that's been over the last couple of years to, to deal with. And actually, I was going to pay tribute to Jeremy Hunt, because Jeremy was the first health secretary who finally made sure that the NHS prioritised mental health, gave it a ring fence budget, and got the focus on it in a way that it hadn't happened before. And I think Jeremy deserves enormous credit for doing that, I mean, well before um, I was even an MP. But the job's not done, as your experience shows, and we've got further to go. And particularly for young people, you know, what I like to see is more mental health provision in educational settings to identify problems earlier. And we've started doing some of that, but there's more we can do. But also, we need to make sure that we stop the problem at source. 
And one thing that's increasingly clear, and this will be different for your daughters, it doesn't from autism, but one of the growing reasons that children and adolescents are suffering from mental health is because of what they see online and what they're exposed to online. And there'll be many parents and grandparents here, like me, with young daughters especially, who will be horrified at what might happen when their kids are using their iPads. And that's why I think we need to crack on with the online safety bill, and we need to really make sure we clamp down on this pernicious content because, yes, we need to get you the support you need for your daughter, but we also make for sure that we're protecting millions of other children from very bad things happening to them, and that's what I'll try and do. You've got an question with the about the online safety bill. This came up in the last session. Would you look to change the bill at all? Do you have any concerns, as it stands, about its free speech provisions? Yeah, there's a very particular bit of the bill that talks about legal but harmful content, and that's the bit that just needs looking at to make sure that we are not overly infringing on free speech. Governments generally should be in the business of saying, this is legal, this is not legal, with a clear line. So that grey area, we need to make sure that we get right. Right, let's go, I'm doing a sort of clockwise thing around the room, it's quite better. Right, and um, the lady there, just about three from the back. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Claudette, um, and I listened very carefully to what you both had to say. You both um, said that you would like to reward hard work. You're interested in your rural areas, and one area of growth that hasn't been mentioned is our elderly population. And that comes hard on your comments about social care. It needs to be fixed, sir. I'm retired and I am a baby boomer. I went back to work because I spent my life working in elderly care. When the pandemic hit, I'm no hero, I wanted to help. I work for a small company and I've got over 40 years experience in all aspects of healthcare, especially dementia, elderly care. I'm getting the question is, are you listening to the state that elderly care is in? We need help now. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. So, yeah, you you know, I, I did something as Chancellor that was quite difficult, and I've got a lot of criticism for it. And actually, my opponent wants to reverse the thing I did, and that was create a brand new funding stream for social care. Because during the pandemic, we all saw some of the frailties of the system exposed, and we don't want to repeat those. And it was very clear, that, and there'll be lots of councillors here in the room, I'm sure, tonight, who grapple with this on a daily and weekly basis. And that's why I did something that, even though it was difficult, I believe it was the right thing to do. Because if we're going to have any hope of properly reforming social care, we do need to put some more funding in. And that's what I did as Chancellor for you and for everyone else who relies on it. We need to also make sure that we improve the quality of social care provision. The people that are working hard in that sector don't feel that they're rewarded, they're valued enough, and part of the funding will go to improving their careers, providing them the support and training that they need to feel valued and fulfilled. Uh, but also, we need to reform things, as I was saying before. Right, so we need to get the NHS to join up better with local councils at a local level. We can't have the NHS keep gobbling up all the money and social care being the poor cousin, because that's not going to work. And to the question over here, we need to fix the funding formulas, because in rural areas like this, the population of elderly people is growing far faster than it is in other areas, and the funding for the Southwest needs to reflect that. In fact, the Southwest is probably the area where the elderly population is growing the fastest in the UK at the moment. So those are all the things I want to do for social care, but all you have to remember is, when it came to it, I did something that was incredibly difficult and personally difficult and politically challenging for me because I believe I want to fix social care. And if we don't do it, we won't win the next election and millions of people will not get the care that they need. Let's keep going, I guess. Many of the young gentlemen just here, please. Thank you. Hi, Rishi. Um, Hi. My name's Eddie. I'm a student here at Exeter. Exeter has some of the world's leading climate scientists, many of whom I've spoken to. Um, one chap in particular, um, Tim Lenton, the director of the Global Systems Institute, he co-authored a paper saying that in a best case scenario, a best case scenario, by 2070, one and a half billion people are going to be living in areas that are too hot for habitation. I'm very concerned with 
the trend that the Conservative government is taking, deporting illegal refugees to Rwanda. Many of these people are fleeing from war-torn regions and climate-ravaged regions. So what is your response? Should we have compassion for the people that are going to be moving to Europe, going to be moving to North America, um, away from the tropics, which are going to become uninhabitable? So if the question is about migration, let me say this very unequivocally. Look, our country is unbelievably special. Our country throughout its history has compassionately welcomed people like my family because this is the place which gives refuge to those fleeing persecution and it integrates them into our society better than any country in the world. And it's something that I, and I'm sure every single person in this room, is extraordinarily proud of because you should be. But, Alongside that, it's also absolutely right that we have control over our borders. It is not right in this day and age that we cannot control who is coming here, what they're doing here, and the risk and the threat that they pose to us, and indeed the cost. Because all of you right now are forking out five million quid a day in hotel costs for people who have come here illegally, and that has to stop. So, I won't... In the interest of time, if you've got five minutes tonight, there's a video on my website with a very detailed 10-point plan about how we're going to do this, but I do believe in the Rwanda policy, but it's not good enough to just announce these things. We need a government that can actually make them work, and that's what I'm going to do, and that's going to mean some legal changes we'll need to make, I will make, but at the end of the day, we must have control over our borders. That is completely consistent with us remaining a compassionate and tolerant country that welcomes people from Syria, Afghanistan, Ukraine, Hong Kong, and indeed my family 60 years ago. That's who we are in Britain, and that's what we will always be. I want to get two more questions in from the back here. I'm going to have to ask you to be as succinct as possible so we can get as many answers. Could I get um, the gentleman just here? Thank you very much, Andrew. Andrew from Exeter. Uh, you, you rightly make the point that in order to achieve change, it requires both policy and character. And that includes the character of the leadership contenders, but also of their, their top teams. And that's very important to us members. So in light of that, um, would you be able to say whether you would invite Gavin Williamson to join your cabinet, please? Well, look, I, I don't think it would be appropriate. I don't think it would be appropriate for me to start talking about individual colleagues like that, about jobs. That's not right, and, and I, think that would, I think hopefully you'll understand that. But I can tell you my approach to building a team. And my approach to building a team in government is to draw on all the talents and traditions of our party. And as you saw in this leadership contest, we've got some fantastic people at the top of the Conservative Party. We've got some fantastic people coming up behind them. And the challenges that our country faces are great. And we would be letting down the British people if we did not put our absolute best people forward to grip those challenges. So that's the kind of team that I'm going to build. It's going to deliver for you, and it's going to deliver for everyone else in this country. It's going to be a team of unbelievably hardworking Conservatives united in our mission to deliver for the British people and win the next election. We're going to try and squeeze in two questions here. I'm sorry, it's probably not ever as much as possible. Uh, could I get the lady who's just up halfway up here, please? Oh, it was actually even one of those ladies back, but yes, of course, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, we'll try and get through as many of them as possible. Yes. I'd like to know uh, how important loyalty is to you because I don't feel you were at all loyal to Boris Johnson. Well, madam, I, I respectfully disagree because I was loyal to Boris Johnson for the two and a half years that I had this job. But you know what, we, we got to a point, we got to a point where, put aside my economic differences, and it wouldn't be right for the country to have a Prime Minister and a Chancellor that weren't on the same page about economic policy, going into the situation that we're going. Something disloyal about leaving in that circumstance, that's the right thing to do for the country, because they deserve to have those two people united. But beyond me and my economic policy differences, we got to a situation where the government was on, yet again, the wrong side of a very serious ethical question. And you know what, it wasn't just me. It was 60 other members of parliament, unprecedented, resigned from government. There we are. Thank you very much. Right, we're going to... 
So, sorry, I'm trying to get around as many people talk about I'm sorry, this is the last question we're going to have here. This gentleman has been had hand up all evening, so I take this one, please. Thank you. And I'm very sorry we didn't get to more of that. Ask, and my name is Philip Beck. Can I just ask, is there a way that those of us who haven't been able to have our questions answered can communicate with the two candidates? Is there a question you'd like to ask Mr. Sunak now, sir? Sorry? Is there a question you'd like to ask Mr. Sunak now? Yes, you would like to ask her. I, there are thousands of pensioners under the Pension Protection Plan who have absolutely no inflation protection whatsoever. And why is that? It's because the Department of Work and Pensions refuses to alter the terms of the PPF, the Public Protection Pension Plan. Yes. And why, why is that happening? In spite of the fact that the civil servants in the in, in the DWP have full pension protection. Right. Can we get something done about that, please? We'd like okay. to take that one. Well, I'll, can, can I, I take, take that, that one away, Philip, and go and have a look at it? But what I can tell you is the triple lock is definitely back. It will be back this autumn for next year, because I do believe we're making sure. There we go. <laughs> Philip, you know what? I know, I know we're over time, and I don't, want to, I don't want to overstay my welcome, but there was someone who shouted out something about corporation tax, which I want to address, if I can. As the last thing, can I, can I? Right, go on, I've, yeah, go for it. I think I'll probably hazard a guess, but uh, you know. No, so uh, my name's Martin Brook, I'm the vice chair of the industry, we're a big company, that's 1,500 SMEs. When 2019 the poll came out, when we won the Stonky majority, I cried. It wasn't crying with joy, it was crying with relief. You see, Corbyn's tax policy on corporation tax was to hike it up. You see, I can afford that for my family, for my business, because I was already spending everything we had on looking after my children, who came here, graduated here. My question is, you are going to put up corporation tax on small businesses the same that Labour would do. That will kill my Business, I wouldn't be able to fund my children at university. Why are you, as a Conservative future potential Prime Minister, ever thinking of Great. whacking the corporation tax up? Got it, right. Perfect. Brilliant. I'm so glad you asked, Martin. I am so glad you asked so we can address this. I'll tell you what I am doing. I am reforming our corporate tax system. I'm reforming it in a radical way to make sure it actually delivers for all of you and this country. Yes, the headline rate of corporation tax is going to go up. But you know what? The rate it's going up to, it's still the lowest in the G7. France, Italy, Germany, Canada, Australia, all the rest of them. Oh, right, right. America, yes. It's the lowest out of those seven countries. Look at the G20 group of countries, the 20 largest economies that we compete with in the world. The rate will still be the fourth lowest, with only, I think, Indonesia, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia lower than us. So it is clearly an internationally competitive rate, and no one can tell you otherwise. Secondly, it doesn't apply to genuinely small and medium-sized businesses. They're going to continue paying the same very low rate that they pay today. 70% of registered British companies are not going to see an increase in their corporation tax. What we're talking about is just the largest ones that are going to see an increase to, again, an internationally very competitive rate. And the third point you should take away is the important one. We are also going to cut taxes for business at the same time. But we're going to cut the taxes on the things that actually make a difference to our growth and our productivity. We're going to cut the taxes on business investment. Because we have tried a failed experiment. The orthodoxy that I'm accused of, that's what I'm going to change. Because that low corporation tax rate we had has done absolutely zilch for investment in our economy. It has not increased. It is still one of the lowest in the developed world. It accounts for half our productivity difference with France and Germany. It's because we businesses don't invest enough. Why? Because our tax system isn't generous enough. So this autumn, I'm going to radically cut taxes on business investment, because that's how you create jobs and growth and better wages for people. And I'm going to cut taxes on business investment in R&D, because we talked about the future economy we want to build. The future economy we're going to build is going to be built on innovation. And again, our companies don't invest enough in R&D, so we're going to cut the taxes on that. So yes, I'm a conservative. Yes, I'm going to cut taxes. Yes, I want to see businesses grow. But I'm not going to stick with the failed plans of the past. I'm going to do something radically different, and that's going to grow our economy. That's what I'll do for you as well. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Rishi Sunak. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. That is it for the second Conservative leadership hustings. I hope you found it informative, enlightening, and it's helped make up some minds about who should be the next Prime Minister. For those of us who are watching remotely, the next leadership hustings will be held on Wednesday in Cardiff, and I'm sure we'll be hearing plenty more from the candidates until then. Thank you once again for all your questions. Thank you for coming out this evening, and thank you for having me.